Welcome back to Logic 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the replacement rule called contraposition. Contraposition works something like this. You start off with a standard implication, if P then Q. You flip-flop the antecedent and the consequent, and you negate both of them. So that leaves you with if not Q, then not P. As it turns out, these two statements are logically equivalent. And what we'll see in this lecture is first, I'm going to explain to you why this is true in English, then I will show you why this is true in a visualization, and then I will prove to you that this is true using a truth table. If P then Q is the exact same thing as saying if not Q, then not P. So let's start off with the English example. Think about this sentence. If I am in the inner sanctum, then I'm in the castle. So if you're not familiar with what an inner sanctum is, the inner sanctum is what you might think of as the castle within the castle. It's the most fortified part of a castle. So if you're in the inner sanctum, then you have to be in the castle as well by virtue of the fact that the inner sanctum is within the castle. So that's straightforward. That implication is straightforward. But now think about the contrapositive of that statement. So in the contrapositive, we switch the antecedent and the consequent. So we move the inner sanctum part to the end, and we put the in the castle part in the beginning, and we negate both of those statements. So that leaves us with, if I'm not in the castle, then I'm not in the inner sanctum. And this should make intuitive sense to you. The inner sanctum is within the castle. So if you're not in the castle, if you're outside of the castle, there's no way that you can be in the inner sanctum. Again, we can look at this visually. So think about the implication, if P, then Q. So we have two sets on your screen. The oval in white is the set P, and the oval in red is the set Q. So if you take any point within P, like that black dot, and any element within P is also in Q. P is enveloped by Q. So if you're in P, then you're in Q. So P could be the inner sanctum and Q could be the castle. If you're in the inner sanctum, then you're definitely in the castle as well. Now let's think about the contrapositive of the statement. So we flip-flop the antecedent and the consequent and we negate both of them. So if you're not in Q, for example, if you're that white dot on the right, you are not within Q, can you be within P? Well, no, you can't. P is within Q, so if you're not in Q, you can't be in P as well. If you're not in the castle, there's no way you can be in the inner sanctum. That's the intuition behind contraposition. And if we look at a truth table, we'll see the exact same results. We'll see that these two statements are equivalent. So we have two simple sentences in the contraposition. We have a P and a Q. And to get from the basics to the more complicated statements, we need the negations of both of those simple sentences. So we have not P and not Q in columns three and four. And then we have the regular implication in column five and the contraposition in column six. I've gone ahead and filled in the first two columns with every combination of truth value for the first two simple sentences. And now we can just work through here. So in column three, we have not P, which is simply flip-flopping the truths and falses of the first column. So instead of having true, true, false, false, we have false, false, true, true. And for not Q, we're doing the same thing with the second column. So in the second column, we had true, false, true, false. Here we have false, true, false, true. We just switched true with false and false with true. Then for column five, we're looking at the standard implication. So if P, then Q. We know that the only way this is false is if P is true and Q is false. In the other cases, if they're both true, then the implication holds as normal. And if P is false, then the implication holds vacuously. It's vacuously true. So we get true, false, true, true. Again, in the second row, it's false because P is true, but Q is false. And then for the sixth column, we do the implication for the negations. So if not Q, then not P. Again, the only way that this is going to be false is if not Q is true, the antecedent is true, and the consequent not P is false. And that, again, is only the case in the second row. So we fill this in as true, false, true, true. The reason that it's true in the first row is because the antecedent is false, so that is vacuously true. For the third row, again, not Q is false, so that statement is vacuously true. And in the last row, both not P and not Q are true, so the implication holds as normal, and we have a true value there. It's only in the second row where not Q is true and not P is false. So if we look at 
the regular implication and we look at the contrapositive of it, so we're looking at columns five and six, we see that the first row is true, the second row is false, the third row is true, and the fourth row is true. The truth values are exactly the same going down the rows. These are logically equivalent statements. So that is contraposition for you. You can see why it's useful, because if you have a contrapositive statement like not Q implies not P, well, you can get rid of a bunch of negations there by simply flip-flopping the antecedent and the consequent and erasing the negations. So again, this co contrapositive, this replacement rule really helps us eliminate these unnecessary logical notations like these negations when there are other statements out there like if P then Q, which represents them exactly as they would be represented in the more complicated way. So again, that's contraposition for you, and I'll see you next time when we talk about more replacement rules. Join me then.